Thank you very much, uh, Martin, for that uh, kind uh, introduction and for hosting this event. Uh, and thank you very much, Albert, for, uh, uh, for organizing uh, what I hope will be a lively discussion. Um, I, I asked some of my uh, Dutch friends for advice on this presentation, including Jules Korkmaz, who's here, and Bert Metz, who many of you know. Uh, was told that I should wear my orange tie and say something nice about Dutch football, and then the rest of the discussion wouldn't matter much. Uh, so I'm, I'm wishing uh, the Netherlands best of luck against Brazil, and I think it's a week or uh, 10 days or so. And also, for those of you who are wondering, uh, uh, I, as far as I know, I'm not related to Leo. I, did you say Beinecker or Beinecker, the football coach? Uh, 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 so I, I don't think there's a, a relation here. But, Enough of football and on to uh, the serious topic of, of climate change. Um, and uh, as Martin mentioned, uh, this talk is uh, derived out of some work in a, in a book that I published a couple of years ago, so a little bit of advertising, uh, uh, which some of you uh, uh, might be familiar with. Uh, but if you're interested in more on these ideas, uh, there's more in the book. Um, the uh, topics I want to cover today, uh, I'm first going to start with what I call the, 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 the last Malthusian trap. And uh, I'll uh, define what that means in a minute, but it's really setting up what is the, uh, the nature uh, of the challenge uh, that we face and, and a little bit of a different way of thinking about the uh, combined climate and growth challenge uh, that we face in the world today. And then I'm going to talk about um, why I believe uh, neoclassical economics, despite being uh, you know, a very powerful and, 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 and historically valuable way of, of looking at the world, is not a well-suited tool uh, for looking at this uh, problem and has some specific limitations um, in how we think about topics like climate change and economic growth. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about an alternative perspective, what I call uh, complexity uh, economics. Uh, and describe uh, how that may offer us a reframing, a different way of, of looking at this problem. Um, and uh, then I'm going to offer some more speculative thoughts on how these ideas may point us in the direction uh, of how we might escape uh, this, uh, this Malthusian uh, uh, trap. And uh, just to look ahead a bit, um, I, I will note that I know that uh, many in this audience have an interest in uh, policy issues, um, that this thinking uh, is still you know, relatively young and immature in an academic sense, so the applications to you know, very concrete Monday morning policy questions is, uh, is still very immature. So what I'm hoping to do with this talk is to spur interest uh, in it from uh, a group uh, such as yourselves, so that uh, pushing these ideas into, into policy uh, and, and thinking through carefully what they mean uh, can be uh, progressed, and I hope in the discussion we'll be able to talk a bit. Uh, about that. So first, uh, Malthus. Um, I'm sure many of you uh, know who, uh, who Malthus was. He was one of the, uh, he was actually trained as an English uh, uh, minister or priest, but was uh, one of the uh, earliest, uh, what we could call economists. And, um, uh, uh, and, he, uh, and I'll come back to his description of, of how the economy works, but I'm going to start with a, just a couple of, of quick facts. So I'm going to summarize um, uh, uh, 2.5 million years of economic history in two charts. Um, now, uh, the significance of 2.5 million years as a starting point is that's when the first uh, stone tools were made by our uh, hominid, not even human, uh, ancestors, and presumably, you know, one uh, hominid cave dweller traded a, you know, a hand axe with another, and we could say that was the moment the economy uh, was uh, was born. Now, uh, admittedly, uh, the data going back 2.5 million years, uh, the economic statistics were not so good then, uh, so there's a lot of extrapolation and, and assumptions in these numbers, but we do have some reasonable idea of what uh, world population has been, and there are you know, pretty reasonable scientific estimates as to how many hominids uh, were alive at this period of time. And if we just do a simple graph of, of world population from this far back, you know, we see that uh, for a long, 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 long time there weren't that many people uh, or hominids in the world, and then all hell broke loose. And we have this explosion in, in, uh, in uh, population in, in uh, historical terms in very recent uh, history. And then even more sketchy data, uh, if we try to estimate world GDP per person uh, going back that far, and this is from some data that Brad DeLong at Berkeley put together, uh, and it, it's not quite as whimsical as you might think. He, in the uh, anthropological and archaeological record, we actually have pretty good ideas of how many calories uh, people had even in, you know, in um, 
uh, in uh, hunter-gatherer uh, tribes that are still around on the earth today or uh, in early settled agricultural populations and so on. And so with a bit of hand-waving, you can sort of roughly translate into some notion of, of standard of living. And uh, we see a similar story that on a per capita basis for a long, 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 long time, the world was really, really, really poor, and then all hell broke loose. Um, now, um, uh, for those of you who are mathematicians in, in the audience, you might know, well, this is just uh, you know, two exponentials you know, shown on, uh, uh, on these uh, scales, so they look very vertical. But uh, in fact, um, uh, these are actually, uh, it's hard to see from this scale, but actually two fairly different uh, time series, and I'll come to that that uh, uh, they are both exponentials, but in this one, the, exponent, the exponent actually starts to slow down here, um, but in this one, it's actually accelerating. And uh, that uh, is something that we'll come back to uh, in a moment. But the basic fact is we have, certainly on you know, kind of a planetary geological time scale, this kind of pulse of human population growth and human uh, wealth coming into the system. Now, um, coming back to, to Malthus, um, uh, what, what Malthus uh, postulated was that uh, any gains in standard of living and in income uh, would be almost immediately translated into population increases. So we do something to say improve productivity of, of farming or we put more land under the plow, uh, that the extra crops would just cause us to have more children uh, and that we would basically you know, expand the population up to some limit or carrying capacity of the, of the system uh, that we're in and that we'd, we'd be sort of plagued with suffering, famines, and, and, and uh, things like that. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, so if wages rise above any subsistence level, they're quickly driven back down to some equilibrium point. And changes in technology don't actually increase, translate into increased wages, they just translate, they move the curve out and, and translate into greater population. Um, and there's been some recent work, uh, mostly uh, primarily by uh, Clark uh, out at the University of California, uh, which actually shows that Malthus was pretty much right up until uh, the 1800s, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, that there were variations in uh, income or standard of living uh, over time, um, but uh, that it largely uh, kept translating into uh, population uh, growth. Uh, now, this doesn't mean that there wasn't some notion of progress uh, or technological change. So if you look at how the very, very wealthy lived circa 1000 AD and, and, uh, you know, versus uh, 1800, you know, their, their lives were, were noticeably different with different technologies and things. But for the average you know, peasant out there, which was 99% you know, of the population, uh, life didn't actually change very much. You know, the world was basically dominated by subsistence uh, agriculture uh, 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 throughout this period. Um, and then um, uh, we had suddenly around 1800 this uh, step change. And about a third of the world escaped from this uh, Malthusian trap uh, in the Industrial Revolution. And we see that uh, about one third of the world saw this just massive climb in uh, income uh, per capita and about two-thirds of the world kept trundling along, uh, still in the Malthusian uh, trap. And of course, this was mostly uh, happening in, in Europe and uh, in uh, North America, and what uh, uh, economists call the Great Divergence, uh, because uh, all of this, for the first time in history, you had parts of the world living you know, vastly different material lives uh, uh, than, uh, than the rest uh, of the world. Um, now, uh, we also uh, know that uh, there was a, a significant environmental consequence of this uh, explosion in the Industrial Revolution um, and um, rise in standards of living. This is my Al Gore moment. Uh, <laughs> that, that was, that was, so if we take that income graph that we just saw compressed to the right time scale and overlay it on this famous uh, IPCC chart, which many of you know, uh, which shows uh, changes in greenhouse gases, um, you know, we see that these curves uh, roughly uh, uh, line up. Now, uh, those of you with a sharp scientific eye will say this is probably meaningless because the scales are all different, et cetera, but graphically it's pretty neat. Um, uh, uh, but, you know, at least at a qualitative level, you get the, get the idea that um, uh, this huge pulse in uh, standards of living resulted also uh, in a pulse uh, in CO2 in the atmosphere starting at around uh, the same time, 1750, uh, 18, uh, 1800. Um, and now we're in the midst of the other two-thirds of the world escaping 
uh, from this Malthusian uh, trap uh, as well. Um, and uh, this, is, uh, this is a chart of what's going on in China and India right now. It's a little bit complicated. So uh, this is some, some recent work we did where we, we looked at uh, household incomes and population size in both countries. So the width of the bars is population, and then rising is, is higher, uh, higher incomes. Uh, and in China, you saw, you know, as recently as 2005, uh, the mass of the population was kind of down here at a pretty low uh, income uh, level. Uh, uh, we're on track for 2015, this huge explosion in the Chinese middle class uh, developing, and by 2025, uh, China will largely be a middle class uh, country, middle class defined by world standards rather than maybe Dutch standards, but uh, still, a, you know, a huge movement in a very large, massive population of the income scale. Uh, and if you look at India, you see a, a, a relatively similar pattern. Um, so uh, big chunks of the rest of the world, uh, maybe even most of the rest of the world, ex-Africa, uh, seem to be also escaping from this Malthusian trap and enjoying real uh, rises in in income. And also, uh, corresponding with that, uh, falling uh, fertility levels. Um, uh, so population increases are slowing, but uh, the math still uh, uh, leads uh, to this uh, huge spike in, in uh, uh, consumption and economic output. Um, and uh, you know another chart that you're, most people in this room are probably pretty familiar with, um, that uh, uh, this, by the world escaping from the previous Malthusian trap of, of you know, famine, stagnant incomes, uh, and um, uh, 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 all gains translating to population growth, that we have created a new Malthusian trap uh, with climate change. Um, and uh, that's, uh, uh, this chart shows uh, various uh, paths of emissions consistent with different stabilization regimes. Uh, so a, uh, a, a peak at 480 to uh, 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 going down to 400, uh, 510, and then uh, 550 uh, uh, ppm path. And if you take the pledges made under the Copenhagen Accord and uh, add them up, you get a range that looks something like this. And many people are even skeptical as to whether we'll, uh, the world will meet the Copenhagen uh, Accord commitments or not. So even under a relatively optimistic scenario, uh, present course and speed, uh, we're on track for something around uh, 550 ppm and a three degree uh, temperature uh, rise or, or possibly, uh, possibly worse. Um, uh, and you know what we're seeing now is another set of limits being imposed on, on increases in human welfare from the physical uh, system of the planet itself. So we've escaped one Malthusian trap uh, only to find ourselves in, a, in another uh, a new one uh, created by the Industrial Revolution itself. And so you know if we then think of what uh, what the world's to-do list looks like, well you know we've uh, uh, we've, we've got to, in essence, redo the Industrial Revolution and create a new uh, economic uh, infrastructure and base and way of living that's uh, consistent with sustainability. Uh, and we need to go from Industrial Revolution 1.0 to Industrial Revolution 2.0 uh, in a way that uh, uh, minimizes the you know, welfare impacts and, and um, uh, uh, impact on growth, particularly the most vulnerable populations in the world, uh, and, and particularly in a way that doesn't prevent uh, the third of the world that's still in the Malthusian trap in places like Africa from in enjoying uh, rising standards of living. Um, and then lastly, and most challenging, we have to do all of the above largely uh, artificially through policy. Uh, the first industrial revolution was a, as we'll talk about in a minute, was a bottom-up uh, emergent uh, phenomena. Nobody uh, got together in a, in a conference center in Copenhagen or in you know, Geneva or Brussels or you know, any other place and decided we're going to have an industrial revolution and have a global agreement on it. Rather, it's something that emerged out of uh, bottom-up processes in the economy. This time, we somehow have to stimulate uh, this large-scale uh, economic uh, transition. Um, and, and so, you know, one way to look at it is this is, it will be the, this is in some ways the greatest exercise of social engineering uh, the world has ever seen. Uh, and we also know from history that previous exercises in social engineering have not turned out so well, so we've got to learn some new things and do some things uh, differently. Um, and this, uh, as an economist, this raises, in my view, some pretty interesting questions. Uh, you know, first of all, 
how did the first industrial if we need to create a new industrial revolution, how did the first industrial revolution occur? Well, how, why did the world trundle along in this relatively stable, you know, um, uh, uh, subsistence agriculture world for literally, you know, uh, millions of years, and then all of a sudden have this phase shift or regime change? And uh, economics really doesn't uh, have a good answer to that. We have an excellent historical narrative. We know all about the Industrial Revolution from you know, how many cotton genies were sold in 1870 to um, you know, uh, what inventions were made and so on. Uh, but in, in theoretical terms, uh, it's viewed as an exogenous shock. You know, somewhere outside the economic system, this thing called the Industrial Revolution happened. Um, so could we uh, create a more endogenous theory of such large-scale uh, change? Um, and then there's a whole set of questions about uh, the you know, transition here, and how do we even think about making the, the, the various uh, uh, trade-offs uh, involved? Um, so uh, I'm now going to argue that, that uh, what I'll call traditional economics has difficulty in answering questions like these, um, and then talk about some, uh, a different way of thinking about the economic uh, system. So uh, a little bit on um, uh, what I'm putting under the label of traditional economics is largely what economists call uh, neoclassical uh, economics. And uh, this is you know, the sort of standard theory found in, in textbooks um, you know, uh, uh, that, that's been taught for the last, uh, last few decades uh, at least. And uh, the, key, the key framing uh, of neoclassical economics is that the economy is an equilibrium system. Uh, like this uh, ball uh, rolling in the bowl, that we can think of the economy as having a set of constraints on it, like the side of the bowl. So uh, constraints can be things like consumer preferences, uh, technologies, uh, and, and, and uh, household budgets, and so on. Um, and then there's a set of forces at work, working on this system of constraints, like gravity working on the ball of the bowl. And in this case, it's the self-interest of consumers and, and producers you know, pursuing profits, um, and you put those two things together, the constraints and the forces at work, and the system drives to a point of stability, a point of rest or equilibrium, just as the ball comes to the bottom of the bowl. Uh, you know, the simplest example is uh, the law of supply and demand. You know, we have uh, supply and demand meeting at a, an equilibrium point or resting point where prices are set, uh, quantities uh, uh, match up in the market, uh, market clears and everybody's, uh, everybody's happy. Um, now, uh, and, and this intellectual framing of the economy as an equilibrium system also translates into the mathematical basis for the way much of, of economics uh, has, has uh, been done uh, over the past few decades. Um, and the, the problem is this, with this is just at a very basic level, uh, and this is just a, a, almost a mathematical point, equilibrium systems don't grow explosively. They don't suddenly take off and do what you saw on those charts. They don't uh, 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 create novelty. So a another factor of the Industrial Revolution was not, not just not the rise in incomes, but also the huge variety creation. I mean, uh, most of the products uh, sitting even uh, in this building you know, didn't exist maybe even 50 years ago, let alone 200 years ago. Um, so there's been a huge increase in the variety uh, in, uh, in our economy. And nor you know, is there a mechanism for explaining the bottom-up, uh, self-organized way that, uh, that, this, uh, that this happens. Uh, instead, uh, you have to reach in equilibrium systems to um, uh, exogenous uh, factors uh, for the creation of novelty and, uh, and growth. And to, to my view, that actually takes the most interesting questions and puts them outside of, of, of uh, economics. Um, and also, the flip side is that in an equilibrium setup, you don't get also spontaneous crashes uh, in, in the, you know, the kind of phenomena that we've just uh, seen uh, with the economic crisis, and, and traditional theory really struggles to, to um, explain what we've just uh, lived through. And I, as part of the research for my book, I went back and asked, well, why, you know, the, as uh, economics frame the system as this system at rest, an equilibrium system? And when you go back and look at the history, you find that it's actually something of an accident, uh, that uh, back in the late 1800s, uh, some... Uh, uh, important economists Leon uh, Walras and, and Stanley Jevons uh, were looking to make economics more mathematical, more uh, rigorous. Before that, it had really been a branch of moral philosophy uh, more than a, what we would call a social science today. 
And so they used the math they had at the time. And they literally went and raided physics textbooks. And I actually went and got the textbooks that they used out of the library. And when you look through the equations, you see you know, the sort of early stirrings of, of, of neoclassical economics. And so they, you know, they literally translated from particle to person and from you know, fields to preferences and you know, uh, borrowed this kind of whole mathematical machinery um, uh, you know, without really understanding maybe what it, uh, what it might, uh, what it might uh, mean. Um, uh, so there's, you know, there's no, uh, it's not like uh, economists went out and studied what are all the possible ways we could think of the economy and it's best described as an equilibrium system. It's more just that was, you know, the, the toolkit uh, that they had uh, at, the, uh, at the time. Um, and there's a few, you know, in, 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 I could give a long list of, of issues with this toolkit, but uh, just a few specific to climate change. Um, what is uh, the, the theory of growth? that uh, how do you make an equilibrium system grow? Well, uh, this is the question that uh, Bob Solo uh, famously answered in the 1950s, and he got a Nobel Prize for probably the shortest equation in economics history. Somebody said you know, the sort of Nobel per term or something, you know, uh, he, he won, the, won the race. Basically says that you've got uh, capital, knowledge, and labor, uh, and uh, you, uh, you mix, them, uh, mix them together, and this, this knowledge factor drives is what actually uh, you know drives uh, growth. And where does this knowledge factor come from? Well, that's outside the system. That's uh, exogenous. Um, and even the so-called endogenous growth theory of recent years just uh, describes why that knowledge factor may have uh, some increasing returns over time. It doesn't actually explain where it comes from or uh, how it how it actually works. And you know this this kind of uh, approach can't again explain something uh, like the Industrial Revolution. And also another important factor from an environmental perspective is you don't see anywhere in that equation uh, the planet. Uh, you know, there's nothing finite uh, or you know, there's no limits in that equation. It can literally grow to infinity. And uh, you know, there's this there was a famous exchange between Herman Daly, who's one of the founders of ecological economics, and Solo on this where you know, uh, Solo said, you know, isn't it a bit of a problem that at least in theory that can go to infinity when we live on a finite planet? And you know, Solo basically just didn't get the question and said, well, you know, why do we need to limit the number of planets or something? <laughs> uh, uh, but you know, there, there's no uh, no connection with the physical basis uh, of the world. Uh, you know, another issue is that um, we have these very strong assumptions in neoclassical economics about uh, about human behavior. And again, if you go back and look at the history, well, did these assumptions come because economists went out and studied people and said, well, this is a good approximation of how people behave? Uh, no, in fact, uh, it originally came in uh, to make the math easier to solve, because you couldn't solve the math if you had more complex uh, assumptions about uh, people. And now, uh, in recent decades, we actually have studied how people really behave and compared it against this idealized model of perfect rationality and found to uh, perhaps no one's surprise except us economists, uh, that people don't actually behave, you know, that when you buy tomatoes in the supermarket, you're not calculating the, you know, the forward rate on yen and, you know, the GDP, you know, what's going to happen to Greece and the euro. Um, you just decide whether you want tomatoes or not. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, this is not to say that human beings are irrational or emotional or, you know, not sometimes profit-driven and not, you know, uh, sometimes uh, calculating but uh, that we do so in, in, in ways that very much depart from this uh, idealized model. And one specific instance of this in um, uh, climate theory is you know, we, uh, many of the models we use in, in uh, climate or environmental assessment involve uh, uh, exponential discounting of the future, uh, particularly in cost-benefit analysis. And um, uh, that's Paul Samuelson on the left who developed discounting theory and that's uh, uh, another famous economist, Charlie Chaplin, on the right. Uh, and, and what real human beings do is something called hyperbolic discounting. We're not actually consistent in how we view time uh, in the future. And it makes a, it may, it makes a big difference if you, uh, if, just as a little example problem, if, you, if you're trying to decide whether it's worth investing, say, a billion dollars on you know, some effort that will save 10 lives per year in perpetuity, um, if you're using uh, normal discounting, the sort of cost per life saved comes out at about you know, $4.7 million. 
if you're using uh, hyperbolic discounting, the real, the real way that people actually think about these things, it comes out much cheaper, so you'd be much more likely to do the project uh, with this view of human behavior than with the idealized rational view. So it can make some, you know, some, um, and I, I don't know if hyperbolic discounting has really been applied yet in, in looking at climate, but it would give you very different answers uh, than uh, conventional methods. Uh, number three, um, uh, in this methodology of cost-benefit analysis, um, we've, you know, uh, we often have this big question of, well, you know, how much is the future worth? You know, how much should we take into account the needs of our children and grandchildren and, 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 and future generations and trade those off against our, our needs today? And there was this famous uh, debate around the Stern Review between you know, the discount rate, and I understand Professor Nordhaus was actually one of the speakers uh, here uh, previously. Um, and uh, there was a great cartoon that I saw that came out uh, when this debate was going on, where it showed uh, two people standing on a completely blown out, apocalyptic, you know, demolished planet, and one guy saying to the other, I think we got the discount rate wrong. <laughs> um, and uh, as a friend of mine noted, if, if this is what we're arguing about, we probably got the problem framed incorrectly. Uh, and uh, in some ways, it's almost an you know, unanswerable uh, argument. Um, and it, the cost-benefit analysis also ignores some very important uh, features of, of uh, the actual climate system. So uh, in, an important uh, assumption in traditional analysis is that risk is distributed you know, bell-shaped or, or normally. Um, but we know uh, from the scientists that, that uh, many risks actually have these fat tails uh, to them. Um, and uh, that... Uh, there's been some very good work, some of you may be familiar with, by a Harvard economist, Martin Weitzman, who's looked at if we actually pay attention to these fat tails rather than just assuming them away, how would that change uh, our analysis? And it turns out it changes it very significantly, even orders of magnitude, you know, what you would be willing to pay for policies to avoid these fat tails can, you know, actually uh, uh, change by, by several, uh, several multiples. And... Um, uh, in fact, Martin Weitzman was at, at LSE uh, just the other night giving, uh, giving a, a lecture on this, and it's, 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 it's quite dramatic, the difference between when you account for fat tails and, and when you don't. Um, a, another uh, issue is that the traditional approaches assume that time runs equally well forwards or, or backwards. Um, in fact, most of the, uh, the traditional neoclassical approach doesn't actually really explicitly take time into account or have directionality or an arrow uh, to, to time, um, and also assumes that the future is independent of the past. There's no notion of, of path dependence, that you know, what I'm doing now sets up what's going to happen next and next and next and next and next. Um, and this is also clearly at odds with the physical climate system. So you know, we know there's quite a number of phenomena that um, are pretty irreversible, at least on human uh, time scales. Um, you know, so if there's major shifts in the ocean currents, uh, or if the Greenland ice uh, sheet collapses, um, you know, these things don't change back easily. Nor can you know, nor can spending money change them back. Because another sort of a hidden assumption in, in the traditional economic approach is there's some amount of money you could spend to undo whatever it is you're you're doing. Um, but uh, there's almost no amount of money we could spend to refreeze the Greenland ice sheet on human timescales, or uh, this is methane escaping from the Siberian tundra. Once the methane's out, it's pretty hard to kind of stuff it, stuff it back, uh, uh, back in. Uh, and again, this notion of irreversibility is not uh, taken into account. So I, I could go on with a much, much longer list, but those are just a, a, a few uh, incompatibilities between the, the neoclassical view and, and the problem of climate change. Now I'm going to offer uh, a, a different perspective, uh, which uh, addresses uh, some of these issues and, and others. Um, starting back in uh, around the 1970s, a number of economists and science, you know, physicists and biologists started to um, question these equilibrium assumptions and, and wonder whether uh, the economy might be better described as uh, a complex adaptive system. And, and some of you may be familiar in, in other sciences, there's been quite a, a, quite a bit of work on these types of systems. And um, a, a simple definition of them is that uh, they're complex, that means they're made up of many interacting parts or, or particles or agents or organizations of agents, that they're distributed systems, um, that they're adaptive, that the parts, particles, agents, 
uh, organizations in them don't just, they're not just static, uh, but they change and uh, react in, uh, over time. So, uh, you know, a, a, a physical system of, of uh, say, crystals forming might be complex in some way, but the, you know, the molecules aren't changing their strategy, so it wouldn't be uh, necessarily adaptive. Um, and then lastly, that uh, we can view these things as systems, that, uh, they're, uh, that they have emergent behavior uh, that arises out of the individual uh, interactions. So you know, if you think of uh, a whirlpool, you, know, you don't see a whirlpool in an individual molecule, water molecule. It's a collective behavior of all of them interacting in a particular way. And it's, even independent, it's an independent structure of the particular uh, particles or, or agents in it. Um, uh, and we can think in the economy of things like inflation or booms and busts in the stock market or unemployment is emergent phenomena of much more micro-level uh, processes. Um, and uh, I'm just going to give a quick illustration of what this notion of a complex adaptive system might look like uh, in an economic uh, context. Um, so, uh, first of all, the economy is made up of, of agents, individuals, all of you in this, in this room. Um, and those agents are heterogeneous, they have different tastes and preferences, different ways of making decisions and so on, and they interact with each other. And some of those interactions uh, come together to form stable structures, uh, you know, uh, teams, organizations, uh, businesses, uh, universities, and, and, and so on. And often those structures have some uh, hierarchical uh, uh, character uh, to them. Um, uh, those Structures are themselves uh, adaptive and, and change their environment, um, and the, the change in color is sort of indicating a change of strategy. And there, the CEO just got fired, uh, mm -hmm. and you know, so so these are not static uh, structures themselves, but they're they're changing and adapting uh, in in response to what's going on in the environment. And then, if we zoom out another level, we get other levels of structure where we have interacting institutions and firms and other organizations creating things like you know, uh, industry sectors, uh, say markets, uh, geographic uh, forms of, of organization. Uh, and then if we, you know, if we zoom kind of all the way out and try to take in a, a picture of the economy as a whole, um, we get something you know, very different feeling than the ball in the bowl metaphor or something you know, almost more uh, kind of organic of a system that's uh, dynamic uh, changing and evolving over time, and uh, that the uh, behavior of the system in one period is creating uh, or leading to structural changes in behavior in the next period, that there's uh, feedback loops and that there's path, uh, uh, path dependence uh, in the system. Um, uh, now, um, if we uh, try to summarize what this complexity economics view looks like versus a traditional economics view, um, we see that it's actually a, a, a quite a different way of, of looking uh, at the economy, that uh, rather than treating the economy as a closed, static, and linear system in equilibrium, um, that uh, the economy is in fact an open, uh, and, and literally open in a thermodynamic sense, that there's energy, physical energy coming into the system from calories, fossil fuels, you know, uh, 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 eating you know, sugar treats, whatever, uh, that, that's powering the behavior of the agents and, and the, the whole, whole system. Um, and that the interactions between the agents aren't uh, always uh, linear. That also that um, uh, the agents in the system uh, are heterogeneous, they're different, uh, and that they behave in a realistic way, that we use rules of thumb uh, and our experience to guide us, not just uh, perfect rationality, that also sometimes we make mistakes, but also human beings are actually very good at learning. Uh, that you know, we, we may make the same mistake a few times, but then eventually we might get it and do something different. Um, also, uh, networks that um, traditional economics uh, uh, often ignores the network structure of the economy. That in, our, uh, in, in many traditional models, um, the economy is assumed to run like a giant eBay auction, uh, in essence, where the only interaction is through price signals in the economy. But we know, uh, we saw this in the banking system, for example, that the network structure of the financial system actually played a big role in, in how the system had contagion and, and, and collapsed, and that the interactions aren't just about uh, uh, price signals. So we need to be explicit in uh, describing those network structures. Also, I mentioned that um, uh, in, in traditional economics, there's been a problem in joining up micro and macroeconomics because uh, there's an assumption of just kind of a linear uh, adding up in the system 
Uh, whereas uh, the complexity view, we uh, view it again as an emergent uh, uh, phenomenon. So again, things like booms and busts in the stock market and, um, and so on come from the micro interactions of the agents. And then lastly, and I'm going to talk about this a bit more, um, that the economy is an evolutionary system in a quite literal way, and I'll describe that in a moment, um, and that that's the way it creates uh, novelty uh, and, uh, and ultimately a source of economic uh, growth uh, and increase in complexity uh, over time. So, uh, you know, you can get the feeling that this is a fairly uh, different way of, of looking at the economy than, uh, than the traditional approach. Now, uh, because it's, I think it's important uh, to the climate topic, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this, uh, this idea of the economy as an evolutionary uh, system. Now, uh, first of all, uh, the idea that the economy is evolutionary is not a new one. Um, uh, in fact, uh, economists invented evolution. It wasn't the biologists. It was our idea. Uh, we came up with it uh, first. Uh, in fact, uh, our friend Malthus uh, thought of it. Uh, and Darwin, in his diary, uh, actually writes that he got the idea for natural selection from, from reading, uh, reading uh, Malthus. But uh, since Darwin's improvements on the idea, um, uh, economists have continued to pick it up and, and try to describe the economy in various evolutionary ways, but actually without much success and also with uh, some notable failures, you know, uh, uh, theories of sort of simplistic theories of social evolution and, you know, uh, survival of the fittest and, you know, as justification for the elites behaving badly and things, things like that. Um, but uh, this has changed in, in, in recent years um, where uh, economists and uh, evolutionary theorists now view evolution as not necessarily a biological phenomena, but really as a computational phenomena. It's an algorithm. Uh, it's a computer program is the sort of easiest way to, to think about it. And it's not one that's necessarily specific to DNA and our genes, but can operate in other sort of media as well. And it's a very simple algorithm. It's a search algorithm for uh, uh, patterns of order in the environment that are, that are fit. And I'll be a bit more specific on that. Uh, and the way it works is you have some process of, of variety creation. So you have a set of designs uh, in the environment, and you have a set of uh, uh, some process for creating variety in the design. So you, know, you can think of a design as being the design for that chair. It's a particular way of solving the problem of providing a comfortable place to sit. Or the design of a tree frog is a particular candidate design for surviving in, say, a Brazilian rainforest. Um, so you've got some environment where you have a variety of designs. You might have a variety of different uh, chair designs or tree frog designs. Uh, and you've got some process that creates that variety. You've also got a process of selection uh, that says against you know, some criteria, some designs are fitter for whatever their purpose are, is than, than others. So you, know, you could have a, a chair that's more comfortable, better looking, cheaper, more durable, whatever the criteria that are relevant are, or a tree frog that's you know, better at uh, uh, getting food and making baby tree frogs you know, might be the criteria in, in, uh, in its environment. Um, and then you have uh, some process of amplification where uh, uh, designs that are fit or successful uh, get scaled up, get made more of, uh, get more control over energy and resources in their environment, and designs that are less fit get de-amplified uh, uh, in, in uh, their environment. Um, and, and you'll note I'm trying to avoid using specific biological terms uh, for this because, uh, again, this is a much more generalized theory than the specific, in, specific instantiation in, in, in uh, biology. So we don't talk about things like um, you know, necessarily even replication, uh, for example. Um, and this process just repeats over and over again. Simple three-step process, uh, and it repeats. And in the biological world, that process has created the huge variety um, and incredible ingenuity of all the designs that we, uh, that we find in the, uh, uh, in the biosphere. And uh, I would argue that a, a very similar process has been at work in, uh, in the econosphere, and uh, one just measure of that that I give in the book is that um, if you actually count up the number of species uh, in the biosphere, um, uh, you know, most estimates are something on the order of 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 8, uh, although these numbers move around uh, a lot. Um, uh, in the book, I estimate the variety of products and services in the economy has exploded in the Industrial Revolution is something on the order of 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 13. So we've actually seen, you know, even bigger and faster process of variety creation in the econosphere than in, in, the, in the biosphere uh, from this process. 
Um, now, uh, how, does, how might this process work in, a, in an economic setting? Um, uh, well, uh, you know, one way to think about evolution is that it's a process for creating design without a designer. That it's sort of an autonomous bootstrapping process for, for creating design. And if you think about the uh, economic system, it's full of design. Uh, so, you know, there's design for physical artifacts in like, you know, chairs or microphones or laptops or you know, what have you. There's designs for uh, social institutions, you know, in, in your departments you have a design and org charts and, uh, and, and, uh, and things like that. Um, but in the economy, why would we need design without a designer? Because we have humans who are doing the designing. Uh, we have our intentionality. You know, somebody designed that chair. Somebody you know, tried to design the organization of your institution. Well, um, uh, I would argue that uh, that's not the complete story. And just as a little example, we'll look at the evolution of the bicycle. So uh, bicycles were uh, invented in uh, sort of Victorian times in, in, uh, in, in England. Um, and uh, groups of, of you know, t tinkerers started using you know, uh, new materials that they had to figure out better ways for getting moving people around using real human transportation. Uh, they hadn't even invented the word bicycle yet. Um, and uh, uh, people uh, tried out a whole variety of designs. And there was a lot of tinkering that went on. And if you go to a museum, you, know, you can see all these different uh, old-fashioned bicycle uh, designs. Now, why is that? Well, because designing uh, the perfect bicycle is too hard a problem. It, uh, there is no answer to it. There is no optimal, from first principles, perfect design for the bicycle. All you can do is come up with the best bicycle design you can come up with, and then you try it out and see if it works, and see if people like it, and, and, and so on. I don't know if any of you were trained as engineers. You know there's this process that you take all the best science and theory and you come up with your your thing, but then at the end of the day you've got to try it in the real world and tinker with it and experiment and get feedback and, and, and modify it. In the book I, I call this process deductive tinkering. Uh, that um, uh, we use our rationality and our deductive powers to plan for the future. We, you know, we're not just making, randomly making bicycle designs, we're trying to make good ones, uh, but we can't know what a good one is until we actually build one. And so the, you know, the bicycle designs that, that uh, worked and were fit got uh, further improved on, more were made on, you know, these ones with the big wheels were pretty hard to ride, people fell over a lot, uh, and so, you know, gradually uh, the design uh, evolved over time with, with people trying to make improvements, using new materials, getting feedback from the environment. So it's this mixture of, of rationality, intentionality, and this kind of tinkering experimentation process. And uh, when you think about it, that's an evolutionary process. There's uh, a process of variety creation, a process of selection, and amplification of, of, of uh, what works. Um, and the role for human creativity and ingenuity is in that variety uh, creation uh, process. And uh, you know, we see in, in the history of, of all sorts of technologies these, you know, these very evolutionary uh, uh, patterns, whether it's bicycles or microchips or oxdrawn plows or, or what have you. Um, and uh, borrowing on some work from, uh, from Dick Nelson at, at Columbia, I postulate that a similar process of, of deductive tinkering is going on not just in what could be called physical technologies, things like bicycles and uh, microchips and oxygen plows, but also in, in what he calls social technologies, which are designs for how we organize ourselves as human beings. So you can think of the design for a hunter-gatherer tribe, the design for a settled agricultural village, uh, or the design for a, you know, a, a government department today, or the design for a, you know, a, a Fortune 500 uh, company. These things are full of uh, these social technologies, ways to organize uh, ourselves. Um, and in the economic world, um, it's firms or businesses that uh, play the role of combining uh, the physical uh, and the social designs into the products and services uh, that we create. So if you, you know, open up the hood inside a, a big company like IBM, you'll see lots of you know, physical technologies for making computers and things, but you'll see lots of social technologies on how to organize a sales force or you know, run a manufacturing plant and so on. And then out of that, uh, we can put those together and we can think of IBM as having a design. And there's alternative designs to how to run a computer company. So HP has a different you know, design than IBM does, and Dell has another one, and Apple another one, and, and, uh, and so on. 
And in each of these three, uh, three realms, we've got this process of evolutionary deductive tinkering going on all the time and throwing up a uh, new uh, variety uh, uh, in, into the system and evolving uh, the state of our uh, technologies. Um, and just to illustrate that you know, this also works very differently uh, than biological evolution, it's a multi-level process. So if we take business plan design, you know, we could think of um, uh, somebody sitting inside a, you know, a big company um, at an individual level and saying, I can do uh, option A, B, or C to improve the design of, you know, say, IBM's, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, computer uh, product lines. Um, well, uh, you know, uh, that's variety creation. I've got multiple options. I think one option is better than the other, based because customers will like it, will make more money, whatever the criteria are. That's selection. And I'm going to assign some people and some budget to go do that. That's amplification. So that's that may be going on at, at an individual level, or in organizations, people sit around a conference table and then have the same conversation at another level up. We could do option A, B, or C. Here's the reasons why we should do uh, option uh, B. Resources, talent, money flow to it. Amplification, and then we get up to the level of markets. Um, you know, we've got. Uh, uh, you know, uh, multiple candidate designs for say, you know, how you sell books in the world. You've got you know, Amazon and Waterstones and you know whatever uh, uh, others there are. And the market, likewise, you know, looks across these different options and uh, uh, makes selections and channels uh, resources. So you have this this uh, evolutionary process working at uh, multiple levels uh, in the system. Now, uh, if this was correct, what, what, some, what would be some predictions that we might make if the economy was indeed an evolutionary system? Well, uh, one thing uh, that we would see is a, a very deep property of evolutionary uh, processes are uh, these uh, nonlinear kind of explosions in uh, variety and uh, uh, energy and, and in the economic case, wealth in the system. So think in biological terms, something like the Cambrian explosion. Um, you know, this is a bit metaphorical, but in some ways, you know, the Industrial Revolution starts looking like, uh, you know, an economic version of the, of the Cambrian explosion. But it's a basic property of evolutionary systems don't proceed in these sort of very smooth ways, but in these kind of very uh, sort of jumpy, jumpy ways. Um, you'd also expect to see increasing variety and, and complexity. Uh, uh, in the system, uh, a natural property of evolutionary systems through what biologists call niche filling, uh, that as the system looks for more and more niches to fill, you get more and more uh, variety in the system. Um, you know, so uh, the, the reason why we have that PC is it filled a particular niche for you know, uh, boring business consultants uh, looking you know, for a cheap uh, black PC. You know, that was the niche it was, uh, it was trying to fill. And then you have uh, you know, Apple filling a set of other niches. Um, and also, uh, these systems are bottom-up. Uh, there's no one in charge, no one in control, no one planning the system, but rather this organization and order creation happens in a, a spontaneous bottom-up way. Uh, but the flip side of evolutionary systems is the second law of, of thermodynamics, that uh, order creation, variety creation, requires energy. Uh, that's the basic law of, of physics, and uh, it also requires that the system exports the Entropy, the disorder that it creates in converting energy to order somewhere else in the system. In the biological world, you know, uh, uh, our, our bodies uh, give off uh, waste products and heat and other uh, um, uh, exports of entropy back into the environment, and our economy, uh, in essence, does uh, the same thing. Economic order doesn't come for free. So one thing that uh, I find appealing about this perspective is it, it, it unites the, the, the physical side of the economy with the, um, the, the sort of more abstract side in a very direct way. I mean, you know, right down to the, uh, to the second law of, of, of thermodynamics. It, uh, it, an evolutionary economic system gives you the kind of uh, uh, results in the environment that we actually observe. Um, so now a, a bit of speculation uh, on uh, how we might bring some of this thinking into, into climate policy. Um, well, you know, the, the first thing is that uh, we might ask, um, how can we uh, now shift this system in a, in a direction that um, uh, helps preserve uh, the planet? Can we actually um, use these evolutionary processes in these three domains uh, to send the system in a, in a, in a different direction? 
And uh, one effect of, of rapid evolution in the system in economic terms is uh, rising productivity, is sort of an aggregate measure of what's happening uh, in the system. And so in, in the Industrial Revolution, uh, one of the biggest characteristics of it was this massive rise in, in productivity. Um, and and one, so one way to think about um, uh, the, the climate problem might be how do we increase the productivity of, the, of the, uh, our use of the natural system of the planet. And um, uh, we can think of a very simple measure, uh, carbon productivity, um, uh, for the economists in the room as a formal definition, but it's, it's actually quite simple. It's basically just how much GDP do we get from emitting a ton of carbon? So how efficient, if we think of, you know, there's a finite amount of atmospheric space, how efficient are we in using that uh, in our productive output? It's, it's the inverse of carbon intensity of GDP. So uh, very, you know, very simple. Uh, but we can think of it as a productivity. Other product, you know, labor productivity is GDP per hour work, capital productivity, GDP per uh, uh, amount of capital invested. This is uh, uh, per carbon unit invested. And if we do some just very simple uh, math, we can start to get a sense of the scale of, of our productivity challenge. So if, let's say we wanted to keep world GDP on roughly the, the real growth path it's been on, about 3% a, a year, and we wanted to combine that with bringing uh, emissions down uh, to um, uh, you know about 20 gigatons uh, by by 2050, so roughly a 450 ppm path. Um, some simple math shows us that carbon productivity has to go from about 740 dollars of GDP today up to 7,300 uh, by uh, 2050. So about a 10 times uh, increase uh, in our productivity. So that gives us just a scalar of, of how big. Uh, the sort of evolutionary challenge is. Um, now, uh, many people object to measures of carbon intensity because it doesn't say anything about actually restricting emissions directly. It's a, it's a relative measure. But so if we look, if, if we assume we're going to cap emissions in some way or you know, we have some finite threshold that we want to reach, another way of looking at it is in order to grow, we have to increase carbon productivity. If we don't increase carbon productivity, then we have to slow growth. That's the basic trade-off. We, you know, we, we, we can't grow and leave carbon productivity where it is and meet uh, any emissions targets. One of those variables has to give. Uh, and you know, this gives just a, uh, you know, shows what that relationship is. The higher the, the, higher the product carbon productivity we achieve, the more growth we can afford. Um, and just to uh, put it in, in context, um, uh, what this level of, if we if we try to um, cap emissions at current levels of carbon productivity, um, uh, we'd be looking at about one um, uh, or, uh, about one ton of uh, CO2 per capita emissions in the year in, in the world versus uh, you know, about 24 for the U.S. today, 12 for Germany. Um, and if you asked in a modern lifestyle, what could you afford in that kind of carbon budget? Well, you could either take one car ride have a few hours of air conditioning, buy one t-shirt, uh, or have a hamburger and fries. Couldn't do all those things, but that would be your kind of budget uh, for the day. So just another way of illustrating the, the huge leap in carbon productivity that's, uh, that's required. Uh, and then, uh, now, now just to put it in historical perspective, the rate of labor productivity in the Industrial Revolution um, uh, is this line here, and uh, we, we got a 10x increase uh, in about 125 years. So on the one hand, that's good news. We have had through, you know, we, we've seen in the economy massive step changes, regime changes in productivity in the world through the Industrial Revolution. It's happened before, but we got to do it three times faster and at the same magnitude. Um, now, uh, where are we today on this measure? Well, uh, if, uh, I, I plotted uh, the carbon productivity of most countries in the world, and uh, you know what you what you see is that um, uh, we're you know we're very very far from that seventy five hundred dollar level. Um, you know, countries like Switzerland are you know up at uh, about five thousand know, dollars, and Norway at about uh, forty two hundred dollars, and 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 so on. So even the the sort of most carbon productive countries in the world are uh, only half that level. And if you again also really accounted for how much uh, consumption carbon they're exporting to China, which is you know, somewhere way down here, uh, it, it, it looks uh, even uh, uh, even worse. Um, so we, we've got a further challenge that we, you know, no one 
today has an economy that looks like the new industrial revolution economy uh, of high carbon productivity that we need to create. And the rate of change in the world is also too slow, current course and speed. So here I've plotted carbon productivity over time for a couple of countries and regions, and you know we see uh, you know some increase. We have been getting uh, more energy efficient uh, through technology over time and more carbon uh, productive, but it's been uh, very slow. This this line shows the trajectory we we need to be on. Um, and you know, we also even have some countries becoming less carbon productive as they industrialize, like India, you know, going from a uh, agricultural society to uh, a more industrialized uh, society. Um, so um, now, just uh, stepping back and, and to start to wrap up, um, how do we combine these two perspectives together? In th this uh, this way of uh, looking at the economy as a complex adaptive system, as an evolutionary system. Uh, that could produce something like the Industrial Revolution and the need to, in essence, artificially induce another uh, Industrial Revolution uh, through, uh, through policy. So I, I'm going to throw out some hypotheses, and I, I really put these out as just you know, food for argument, uh, because no one's actually really thought about this. Uh, and uh, I think this is a very important research program uh, uh, going forward. But uh, I, I, a couple of things I might speculate on. One is just that uh, we are vastly underestimating actually the risk uh, in climate change that the, our traditional cost benefit models and integrated assessment models and other tools which are you know uh, all uh, you know uh, very good in their in their you know rigor and have lots of data in them and lots of work in them but uh, the assumptions underlying them ignore these key uh, these key factors and if we actually brought those factors in we'd be a lot more worried than we are even now uh, second that um, you know the, the the sort of the neoclassical approach has also led us very directly into this notion of a carbon price as being the you know the core uh, of any policy response, and that uh, you know the economy would respond to uh, change in price signals with reallocation of resources and, and innovation and so on. And you know that that may be at least partially true. Uh, none of what I've said takes away from the importance of, of price signals in the economy. Uh, but it also encourages us to recognize price signals occur in a very noisy, complex system. They don't just feed through in a, in a very direct way. So they may be a valuable tool in getting the executive of a coal utility to change uh, his or her behavior, but getting a consumer in the supermarket to buy a different brand of laundry detergent, it may not, may not work so well. Um, and we should also just be, you know, take note that, you know, when we ask what, were, you know, look at the historical narratives and data on the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution didn't cause be, happen because there was a big spike in the price of labor. Um, uh, it happened for a whole complex set of socio-economic uh, reasons. And in fact, uh, labor costs were were falling. Uh, in fact, in, in some of the key uh, key countries. So instead, maybe we should also look to these broader uh, socio-economic uh, uh, factors as well. Um, and uh, uh, one way to think about that is if the economy is an evolutionary system, it's responding to some fitness function, some complex and maybe even unknowable set of price signals, consumer tastes and behavior, uh, you know, institutional rule sets, inertia, um, you know, a whole set of things that come together to decide what succeeds and what fails in the economy, what businesses are successful, which ones fail, what products succeed, which ones fail. Again, it's more than about price. And maybe we should be thinking about how do we change that broad fitness function uh, uh, as well. And you know, regulations and standards, uh, uh, that, um, you know, auto efficiency standards, uh, vehicle standards, uh, uh, um, energy efficiency standards, renewable portfolio standards, in some ways are a, a more direct way of, of you know, intervening or changing the, uh, the fitness function. Um, but we also need to look at things like behavior, social norms, uh, and, uh, and things like that. I was struck by a recent uh, by a study I saw on success in recycling programs um, where uh, it had nothing to do with you know, uh, uh, money factors, but uh, recycling programs that created mutual obligation among neighbors, you know, putting the bin out on the curb and your neighbors could see that you were either a good or bad recyclable. <coughs> People were much more sensitive to that kind of social norming behavior than they were to any sort of monetary uh, in incentives. Um, uh, also that... Uh, Again, this theme of bringing in you know, real human behavior that our, 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 our policy and our politics need to uh, address what we know 
from behavioral economics about what I call uh, homo uh, realitis uh, rather than homo economicus. Um, so just one small example, <clears throat> one of the strongest results in behavioral economics is what's called the endowment effect. We're all very sensitive to having things taken away from us. Uh, there are these experiments where you know, they, they ask somebody how much they would pay for you know, a coffee cup or something, and they give a price. And then they give somebody the coffee cup, now it's my coffee cup, and then they ask how much you would sell it for, and you get you know, a, a huge increase in the price because I own it now, it's my coffee cup, I'm gonna resist, you know, uh, I think it's worth more than it is. And if you think about the whole way uh, the climate debate has been framed, it's been framed about taking things away from people. You know, uh, uh, you know we're going to take away uh, your freedom to you know, drive what you want, eat what you want, live where you, you know, in the house that you want. We're going to take away your money through taxes uh, and, 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 and so on. Uh, so uh, we're, we're, in essence, fighting uh, this very strong psychological effect. Could we flip it on its side and, and reframe it in a way that actually uses that endowment effect? It's my atmosphere, my oceans, my forests that uh, is being taken away. So just a... Another example. Um, another hypothesis would be that we pay a lot of attention to physical technology innovations in the climate debate, you know, carbon capture and storage, solar, so on. That continues to be very important. But what about the social technologies? Again, in the Industrial Revolution, if you ask me actually what was the most important invention in the Industrial Revolution, it wasn't the steam engine, it was the Joint Stock Corporation. Because the Joint Stock Corporation, a social innovation, uh, Parliament Act of 1855 in, in the UK allowed uh, the pooling of capital in very large amounts for the first time and distribution of risk and, and so on, which enabled things like the steam engine to be exploited at scale and railroads to get built. So what are the new social technologies that need to be uh, developed in, in, in this uh, industrial revolution? Um, also, can we think about uh, you know, encouraging, uh, speeding up, accelerating this uh, evolutionary innovation process. What can we do to increase the variety rate in the system? The, uh, as the venture capitalist Vinod Kosa likes to say, the shots on goal. Uh, can we up that rate uh, dramatically? Again, can we bias the fitness function in favor of low carbon solutions? Uh, what do we need to do to have the amplification system where talent, where capital flows uh, go to uh, low carbon strategies? Um, uh, there's been some very interesting work some of you may be familiar with on innovation clusters that's, that's very consistent with this uh, complexity view of uh, that uh, innovation happens in these very sort of densely interlocking webs or networks of capabilities and talent and capital. Uh, they don't just happen in isolation, so what can we do to encourage the formation of those? Um, and then lastly, um, uh, when one looks at the uh, evolutionary history of, of international regimes of cooperation, uh, one sees a much more bottom-up phenomena of, of, uh, of building trust and scaling up over time, such as the emergence of the uh, international trade regime. And uh, yet, you know, the, the, the thrust, at least since Rio, has been through a much more top-down approach uh, to uh, international cooperation. We saw the limitations of that in, uh, in, in, in Copenhagen in, in uh, uh, in, in very stark uh, relief. Um, so is there a way to stimulate more a bottom-up evolution of an international regime of, of uh, cooperation? So um, just, to, just to summarize, um, as we said, the Industrial Revolution enabled the, a third of the population to escape this first Malthusian uh, trap of being limited to subsistence uh, agriculture. Uh, but it created uh, what may be our last, if we don't cure it, a Malthusian trap of climate change. Uh, we need this uh, new industrial uh, revolution to escape this, this next trap. Um, and that uh, such revolutions are profound disequilibrium phenomena. And the conventional toolkit we have is just not well equipped to help us really understand those kind of uh, phenomena. And that uh, this complex systems view may give us a new lens, a new toolkit uh, for trying to understand um, uh, these kinds of, of systems. And that uh, by reframing and thinking about how can climate policies uh, activate, uh, activate these, uh, these processes, uh, these evolutionary processes in, in the economy, uh, we might get some, uh, some uh, different and more powerful answers. So just to, just to finish, uh, as Albert Einstein said, we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking when we created it. We need a, a reframing, a new way of thinking about these problems. Um, and uh, uh, unless we actually understand this interlinked, very heavily interlinked, 
physical, planetary, and economic system as it actually is, rather than in an idealized world, uh, we will not succeed, and we, we can't afford to fail. Uh, but I'm optimistic that if we can more deeply understand these, these interlocked systems for what they are, that we've got a chance. Thank you.